Good evening, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you. I'm Eugenio Refini. I'm the chair of the Department of Italian Studies here at NYU. And uh, on behalf of the department and on behalf of Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo, I'm very happy to welcome you tonight to this event, which is um, going to be, I think, a very productive um, conversation around uh, a fascinating object. We will hear more about it um, in a second. Uh, I'm truly delighted to have uh, two special guests tonight. Um, our main presenter, um, Dr. Elizabeth Rodini, uh, we will be talking about her book on the portrait of uh, Mehmed II uh, by Gentile Bellini. And then we have um, Alex Dika Segerman from uh, Rutgers University, who will be responding to uh, Elizabeth's paper, um, and uh, then we will have a conversation. So the format of the evening really begins with um, a presentation by Elizabeth, who will uh, sort of uh, lead us through the main features uh, of her fascinating book, Gentile Bellini's Portrait of Mehmed II, Lives and Afterlives of an Iconic Image, um, which came out in 2020 um, with Bloomsbury. And, uh, and then we will uh, have um, a response from Alex and then after that we will have a proper conversation and with time for um, questions from the audience as well. Um, I will introduce Elizabeth first. Um, you know, Elizabeth is uh, a great colleague, also a friend, and I'm very happy to be able to say that over the past few years we have been having all sorts of fun and interesting conversations, uh, and it's really nice to have you um, here tonight. Um, so Elizabeth most recently served as the Andrew High School Arts Director and Interim Director of the American Academy Academy in Rome. Um, previously, she spent 15 years at Johns Hopkins University, where she was a teaching professor in history of art and the founding director of the program in museums and society. Her publications have centered on cross-cultural encounters in the early modern Mediterranean, uh, and her work is continually motivated by interest in the long, multivalent lives of places and things. And actually, the book which we are discussing tonight is um, in a stable example of this interest of uh, Elizabeth's. Um, Elizabeth is also very busy at work with another project, which is also extremely um, fascinating, um, entitled On the Street of the Hidden Shops, a metaphoric archaeology of Rome, um, which we will uh, hope to see soon out with uh, University of Chicago Press. This is a book which examines the history of a single block um, in a city um, in Rome through the, the stories of those people who lived and worked there across 2,000 years, um, using alternative narratives modes to bring the block to life and broaden our understanding of the past, which of course is a very different project when compared to the Gentile Bellini one, but I think it shares with it this idea of looking at places and things across time uh, and really trying to see how the multi-layered stratification of things um, happening and moving across time and space build whatever we consider to be the past. So um, I will introduce Alex later. Um, so please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Rodini to the podium. Um, Um, hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank Eugenio, first of all, for that very kind introduction and just for this opportunity to be here. Um, and I want to thank the audience because it's a really ugly day out, and so making the, the time and making the effort to be here is very much appreciated. I'm grateful to the Casa Italiana, Zerilli Marimo, uh, for hosting, and its director, Stefano Albertini, for making this possible, and also Julian Sachs for his support in getting everything organized. But mostly, uh, I, I'd like to thank my, my co-presenter, um, Alex Dika Segerman, who I met last summer, and it's really nice at this point in your career to be meeting new people and new colleagues. It doesn't happen quite as easily as it did once upon a time. And we, we had the great privilege of spending two weeks together um, on a Cress Foundation sponsored workshop on the digital image in, in art history in Florence. Um, and so we had many wonderful chances to talk. And Alex, as you'll hear, is a scholar of modern Egyptian, Egyptian modernism, so modern Islamic art, 
And we talked a lot about global art history and what that means. And she told me, you know, I teach this painting all the time. Uh, it's sort of my colleagues in Islamic art, we get called on to teach global art history. And I'd really like to know more about this picture and, and share it with more people. So Alex, you kind of spurred me to do this. So thank you. And <laughs> I'm glad we have this chance to talk. OK, um, I'm going to get started. Um, I'm going to be speaking about this painting. This is, uh, as Eugenio said, Gentile Bellini's portrait of Sultan Mehmet II. It was produced at the Ottoman court in Istanbul in 1480, and it now belongs to the National Gallery in London. And I want to give you a very brief story of its production to begin. Uh, in 1479, the Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II sent an envoy to the Venetian Senate asking for the loan of a painter to his court. Most of the work that Gentile Bellini did there is lost. This is one of the surviving uh, objects. It's the most important by far of what survived. And it's also definitely an outlier in, in that project. It's um, a nearly life-size oil painting uh, made to hang on a wall. It's illusionistic to give you the sense that you're looking through something, through an arch to see Mehmet. It's also a very much an outlier in what was being produced in the Islamic world at the Ottoman court in that period, where these sort of illusionistic paintings to be hung on walls were not part of the visual tradition. Um, Gentile Bellini returned to Venice in 1481, and the painting disappeared for about 400 years. We don't know really exactly where it was. Um, if you read my book uh, and you go to chapter four, you can read some of my thoughts of where of my, about where it might have been. I think it was probably in Venice. But an important thing is that its fame and its influence really lingered on, both at the Ottoman court. There was a tradition that at the end of the 16th century, so 100 years later, the then ruling sultan sent a delegate to Venice to look for authentic portraits of historic sultans, which I believe plays into this memory of, of Gentile Bellini's visit. And in, in the West, there was a very strong memory of this event. Um, Gentile was renowned as a traveler, and that's largely thanks to the biographer Giorgio Vasari, who um, wrote in the mid-16th century lots of stories about the lives of the artist, and the story of Gentile's travels was a very important part of that biography. So that when this uh, painting reappeared in the 19th century in Venice, uh, people knew what it was, even though it had been missing for so long. And it's really always intrigued art historians. Um, they've long framed it, we've long framed it as a sort of proto-ethnographic image of a Turk, an accurate one. It was called the first accurate image of a Turk by some art historians, um, sort of to show the West what this guy looked like. To me, I think this really misses one of the key points of the picture and why it was produced. And I'm going to be saying more about that in a little bit. It's still a very famous picture. Um, Leah Markey has called it a newcomer to the canon of Italian Renaissance art as that field becomes more global. And it's really canonic in global art history as a whole. And I think Alex is going to be talking more about that in a little bit. Um, generally, this globalism centers on the story of the encounter between the artist and the patron and the production of this artwork. And this, of course, is a useful and important moment, an important understanding, but it's also limiting. It tends to freeze the picture in this encounter between East and West at this single moment. And my book is premised on the idea that there is a lot of value in attending to the longer life of the artwork, of understanding where it was in different moments and how it got interpreted and received at different moments. And I show you the table of contents of my book just to give you a sense of some of the themes that I cover. Um, and I think we can really gain a lot uh, by interrogating a painting over this long duration. Now, I can't cover all of this today. I won't. It's a plug to read the book. Um, but I do want to take you on a selective journey through this painting's life with a particular eye, in this case, to its global identity. To do this, I'm going to be focusing on matters of display and exhibition. That is, where was it presented and what sort of context? And I think this is a really valuable tool for understanding how the painting has been received and valued and interpreted <coughs> at different moments and in different places. So we're going to be making four stops on our journey. We'll start in Istanbul and we'll look at the painting's production and, importantly, what I think was its private 
uh, usage. It was made in, in and for a space of private contemplation at the Topkapi Palace. Then we'll go to Venice, 1865, with the recovery of the picture, and we'll talk about it in another private collection, this of, this of the Orientalist collector, Austin Henry Layard. Then we'll move to London, and we'll really spend the 20th century in London. So we're going to look at it uh, in three distinct exhibition moments across the 20th and briefly the 21st century. And we'll conclude back in Istanbul in 1999, looking at an exhibition there and thinking about a little bit of its aftermath. I know this looks like a lot, but I'm going to be really concise. We're going to be moving quickly, um, leaving a lot for discussion and, and maybe even further reading. Uh, so Istanbul 1480, I want to begin with a little more of an introduction to the painting and its production and talk about theories about that production and what I think it meant at the Ottoman court. So who and what are we talking about? Um, Mehmet II uh, is the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire and you can see his empire here in brown. This is at its extent in 1481, that's when Gentile Bellini was there, and you can see also how it's going to expand over the next few centuries. Um, Mehmet was a major political player in the world at this point. He was on and off an ally and an enemy of the Venetians, um, and he was very much feared in the West. And his fame and the fear really come from uh, the fact that he conquered the city of Constantinople uh, in 1453, took down the Byzantine Empire by doing this, and made this city over as his capital, which I'm going to be calling Istanbul, but it re retained the name Constantinople even into the 19th century. Um, by the way, he was 21 when he did this, so he was, um, he was considered a pretty powerful individual. He was also, really importantly, a scholar. Um, he studied with tutors in Arabic, Greek, and Latin. He studied history, he studied science, he had broad interests in many things. It appears that he collected Christian religious objects because he was, in, not because he was Christian, he was a Muslim, but because he was interested in what those were and, and what these Christians did with these things. Um, and he was a very powerful and prolific patron of the arts. He had a very lively court and he invited many people from abroad to uh, work at his court. Um, and one of those people um, is Gentile Bellini, who you see here in the print uh, on, uh, above uh, um, the, the Sultan. Who is he? He is the uh, son of Jacopo Bellini and the uh, older brother of Giovanni Bellini. Giovanni Bellini being um, maybe today, certainly today, the more famous of the Bellini brothers. But in his day, Gentile was really the star. He was considered the best painter in, in the city. He was the preferred painter of the doge and of the circle of the doge, the rulers of the city. Um, so. The, the records of, of the Venetian Senate tell us that in 1479, an envoy appeared at the behest of Mehmet II asking for the loan of a painter skilled in portraiture. And the word in the Venetian documents is someone skilled in retracti or ritracti. Um, this is typically interpreted as portraits, but I prefer to interpret it as painting after life. And I think you can see why Gentile Bellini was considered so skilled in this regard, right? So he was considered really, really good at making illusionistic pictures, pictures that were very similar, that traced the, the, the lines of the real world that we could call mimetic. So he was chosen as the best, um, and he was sent to the court in Istanbul in 1480. Now, there are several key questions about this portrait that I want to talk about. First of all, what was Mehmet looking for? Why did he commission a portrait like this? What was the request about? And secondly, what role did the portrait play for Mehmet? I believe, as I said earlier, that it really played a private function. And this may seem to clash with the format of the portrait. It's a very formal pose. He's framed in this elaborate architecture. He's wearing official garb. There are the sort of emblems hovering around him, those crowns. So it looks like a portrait made for a public propagandistic function. But I want to suggest to you why I think it was made for a different function. And I have two reasons for thinking this. First, we know that Mehmet as a patron had a very strong interest in new technologies, in all sorts of fields, in science, in architecture, in military science, and in art. 
And in this case, what did new technology mean? In Italy, in the mid 15th century, the most avant-garde kind of painting was very similar painting. It was painting that seemed to mimic or mirror the, the world. It was painting after life. This is what Italian painting was becoming famous for. And I think Mehmet must have known this. He was a very worldly, educated individual. As I mentioned, he was very well read. And there were texts coming out of Italy about this, including a very important treatise from the 1430s by Leon Battista Alberti that talked about how to make paintings after life, including notably the use of perspective. Another kind of side note, but interesting, is that Mehmet seems to have had a long-standing interest in lifelike imagery. And these are some sketches of heads that have been attributed to more Mehmet. So I would say that it's probably better that he became a patron than <laughs> an artist. But it does suggest to you that he's interested in this sort of question very early on. Um, so there are various stories suggesting that Mehmet was testing Gentile Bellini and his images. Gentile says that when he returns to Venice. In 1481, he told a chronicler named Jacopo Filippo Foresti that the Sultan had intended to, quote, test his skill, test Gentile's skill and his entire art. There are also traditions in the stories that were passed down about the Sultan comparing Gentile's work to life. The most famous of these stories is told again by Vasari in the mid 16th century, and it's passed down. And here's some proof that it was passed down. This is a painting of 1834 repeating this story from Vasari. This is a story that we have to be uh, pretty careful about, but I'm going to tell you um, we have the Sultan reclining on the couch. And we have Gentile Bellini at right in the orange um, garment holding a painting. It's a painting of the beheaded head, the severed head of St. John the Baptist. And sitting, kneeling before the Sultan is a young man. The story Vasari tells is that the Sultan called an enslaved boy into his quarters and had him beheaded so that he could compare the severed neck of the boy to the severed neck of the painting. Um, this is another story that goes along with uh, Vasari saying that the Sultan sent Gentile Bellini home because his pictures were considered miraculous and so frightening that he really couldn't handle their presence in his court anymore. I think what these stories tell us above all is about this fear of Mehmet that I mentioned earlier, that he's this a strange, uh, maybe you know, sort of naive individual who doesn't really understand painting. It's very um, derogatory of Mehmet as a patron. Um, and so like always with Vasari, we have to take his stories with a, a very generous helping of salt. But um, the point that I would bring out is there's this consistent emphasis in the narratives about Mehmet's interest in the potential of painting to duplicate the visual world. Now, interestingly, Gentile brought a gift to the Sultan. And this was a, a beautiful drawing album um, drawn by his father, Jacopo Bellini. And it was really a set of studies. It's really a manual for these representational technologies that I've mentioned, especially perspective. And if you look at these drawings, you can see, yes, they're about something. But what they're really about is how an artist can construct a space to make it seem uh, somehow um, real and three-dimensional. Um, so it, it seems like the perfect gift for a patron who's interested in these sorts of questions about how painting worked to create illusion. The second reason that I think this was a really personal commission has to do with the court of, uh, Gentile, uh, of Mehmet II, um, and that is its layout. Mehmet established uh, the, the Topkapi Palace, built this palace in Istanbul, and it reflects in its structure the very, very hierarchical nature of his court, which said that um, you could only gain access to the sultan if you were at a very certain level of society. And so the palace is built with these layered courtyards. You, you can stand outside. If you're at a certain level, you can come into courtyard B. If you're at a higher level, you can come in, I'm sorry, A, higher level, you can come into B. 
And, and likewise, access to the viewing of the Sultan was controlled. So this space here in Courtyard B is the Chamber of Petitions where ambassadors came to the court. But they couldn't see the Sultan. He would sit behind a screen. He was hidden. So this presentation of the Sultan in an archway is actually very interesting from that point of view. But one thing that Guru Nejipolu, who's done the most magnificent study of this palace, tells us is that the most private area of the court this area that I've circled in red is the bath plus treasury. You can imagine that that's a, a super intimate space within the court. And that this was not only a place for the storage of treasure, but it was a place for display of treasure and a place to, for, for the sultan to sit and admire the things that he collected. There is good reason to believe that Gentile Bellini had access to this space. And we know this from witnesses to the court who tell us stories about his time at the court. Um, it seems likely that that would be the place where they would have met to discuss Jacopo Bellini's album. It seems likely to me that that's where he would have painted the Sultan, because you're not going to set up an easel and sketch the Sultan in the middle of the courtyard, given that his visibility is so carefully protected. And surely that's where the painting hung later when Mehmet wanted to study it. So I think this was a very private picture produced for this very private space. So what? What difference does it make? I think this really changes how we understand this portrait, right? It's not a portrait that was painted to display the Sultan to the world or to show the West what he looked like as it has been interpreted in art historical narrative, but really to answer the interests of the Sultan himself. It really gives power to Mehmet as the patron to answer his own personal curiosities about what Italian painting could do and maybe even challenge its ability to do those things. So if we think about this theme of globalism and who has the power, if we think about it as power, I think this really flips the power. It's not just that Mehmet is the simple sultan who invites this guy and then is amazed by the sleight of hand that Bellini is able to demonstrate. But Mehmet is very firmly in the driver's seat. And he's even sort of talking back to the painter in this framing. OK, so I want to skip ahead now, just a mere 100, 400 years or so, to 1865 and the rediscovery of this painting in Venice, where I believe it had probably been for most of the previous four centuries. It was purchased by this man, uh, a British resident in Venice named Austin Henry Layard. And for Layard, I believe, again, we can think of a very sort of personal relationship with this picture, which is defined in this case by an Orientalist framework of relationships with um, the Ottoman territories. So who was this guy? Uh, he was, first of all, he was a collector, scholar, writer about Italian Renaissance painting. Among other things, he edited the sixth edition of Franz Theodor Kugler's handbook of Italian painting. Um, but he was also, <coughs> but he was also, um, importantly, the archaeologist of Nineveh, which was one of the most important Assyrian sites in what is today uh, Iraq. And he, you can see him up above commanding the archaeological site as the local work, workers remove these sculptures to take them to London and put them in the British Museum, which is where they are today. There is really nothing more colonial, nothing more Orientalist than this act of taking, possessing the archaeological treasures, the historic treasures of a distant Oriental country, to use the word that was being used in Britain at this time, and moving them to London where they can be controlled and interpreted within a museum space. It's sort of the quintessential Orientalist act. But also, interestingly, uh, Layard became the ambassador to the Ottoman court to Sultan Abdul Hamid II from 1877 to, 18, 1877 to 1880. And in this uh, role, we know that he traveled to many of the exact same places and the same spaces as Gentile Bellini had, including the treasury. And we know this thanks to the wonderful diary of his wife, Lady Enid, who kept detailed accounts of everywhere they went. 
For many decades, the painting hung prominently in the Layard's Venetian palace, the Cappello, um, and it hung among other paintings, but also among, and I'm quoting a couple visitors to the, the, the palace here, among the Hindu and Persian arms he collected, and the marbles from his Assyrian digs, which, quote, encrusted the staircases. And someone writes also about the pet parrot that would fly around and kind of land on the, on the artworks. And I throw that in because it's amusing, but also it gives you a sense of what a personal sort of approach it, it was to collecting and displaying objects. The Layards were great uh, hosts. They had many, many famous and open parties. They invited artists, writers, celebrities of the day, nobles, Queen Margherita of Italy came. We know all this again through Lady Layard's diaries. And one visitor described seeing uh, Layard's collection there this way, as seeing it through the glimmer of torchlight, the sparkle of gems, the flash of gold and silverware, among the hazy darting figures of women on unforgettable evenings in Venetian society. So there's this highly personal framing of the image, and I also want to point out how highly feminized it is. And this is another way in which the Orient was often talked about in this period, sort of the Orient as the weak, feminine, uh, counterpart to the masculine, strong West. This is part of that discourse of power that imbues the Orientalist conversation. Um, and I, I, I just, I can't resist showing you this because I think it embodies this in other sorts of ways. This is a portrait of Lady Enid, and she, around her wet neck, she's wearing a necklace made out of Assyrian cylinder seals that her husband had collected brought to London and then had made into this necklace, which he presented to her as a wedding gift. She apparently didn't really like to wear it very much. Um, but what I think is interesting here is we've got this marking of the female body with these appropriated objects. So it very much plays into this discourse of the feminized orient. I think there's a lot to unpack in this image. Now, um, here we have Austin Henry Layard dressed up in an oriental costume, which he said he wore for comfort and camouflage. But my key point really here is that when we look at these two images together, we can see, we can imagine, I think, that Layard really saw something of himself in this picture. Not that he saw himself literally in the picture, but that he saw his experiences reflected back through this picture when he contemplated the portrait. And in fact, a reporter tells us as much in 1912. Um, saying, although he only had the appointment to the Ottoman embassy for a short time, Layard often recalled it with interest when contemplating the portrait of Sultan Mehmet II by Gentile Bellini. Now this is exactly how Edward Said frames Orientalism, that it's less about the other than it's really about the self looking at, for oneself through the other, that it's very sort of egocentric, it's about me, not really about you. Um, and, I, and I think that's how I would like to think about this picture in the context of the Layard collection. Um, the National Gallery eventually inherited this portrait and it went to London in 1916. There's a brief chapter that I just want to nod to right here but I can't really speak about and that is the effort by the Italian government to keep this portrait in Italy. Um, in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, Italy was starting to think about using its Italian pat its cultural heritage as part of a sort of definition of national patrimony and national identity. And there were laws beginning to be put in place to keep Italian heritage in Italy. And this painting appears on the very first list of what were called vinculated objects. So they were objects that were uh, intended to stay in Italy and not be allowed to leave. Um, and it's important was such that even the ambassador to Italy, the British ambassador, compared the picture in the eyes of the Italians to the value of the Elgin marbles to the Athenians. So pointing out even in 1913 this really uh, iconic um, object of patrimony claim. So that's a little aside. Um, the painting made it quickly to London. Um, not only did it have to ex um, escape these legal attempts to keep it in Italy, but it had to uh, escape World War I, and the whole collection made it across sea and rail to London safely and arrived there in 1916. And I want now to look at three moments of exhibition in, in, in London over the course of the 20th century. 
So when the, when the painting arrived at the National Gallery, um, why did it go there? Layard willed his whole collection to the National Gallery. Um, he was a trustee there. He had even been offered the directorship. This is the day when you, know, you just did that. You were the ambassador, and then you, were, you just kind of did everything. Um, there was actually a lawsuit surrounding its arrival at the gallery, and that's chapter eight of my book, if you're interested. It has to do with the definition of portraiture. Um, but it was received, especially the portrait of Mehmet, was received with huge excitement. Um, the public loved it. The press loved it. They called it the work of a great and rarely found Venetian master and the foremost and most interesting work in the newly acquired Layard collection. And it was soon moved into the Italian painting galleries with the other great masters, including Giovanni Bellini's paintings. So it's part of this heroicizing story of Italian Renaissance art. And if you think about the placement of Italian Renaissance galleries in most museums, most sort of um, universal museums, you'll still find the Italian paintings usually have a, a prime position in the galleries. So here it is sort of elevated among the most important works in the museum's collection. But there were doubters, especially about its condition. And these included some pretty important people, including uh, J.P. Hesseltine, who was a trustee, and again, Ambassador Rod, who both worried about the extent to which the painting had been repainted, and Rod even expressed doubts about its attribution to Gentile Bellini at all. So this is some pretty damning criticism. Uh, and after the Second World War, the director of the National Gallery concurred and downgraded the painting. It got put in Gallery A in the lower level of the museum, the, the gallery for problematic and damaged works. Um, this is where I first saw it in 2003. Uh, the gallery is open one afternoon a week, you know, so this is not, this is how far it has sunk, right? It is now sort of in, in the basement, literally the basement of the museum. So just to give you a sense of how a museum expresses value and, and, and makes it known, you can see this with this painting. The most interesting thing that happened, though, is what happened in 2009, when it was moved across town on long-term loan to the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is where you can see it today. Um, now, this is not a fine arts museum. It's a museum of decorative art and design. And the painting now hangs in a gallery that's dedicated to global trade. It's titled A World of Goods. And there's a painting, but as you can see, perhaps, there are other objects of trade, glass and metalwork. There are carpets. There are objects that fall into that uh, trans-Mediterranean trade network. This again shows us a shift in the value of the painting or how it's understood. Here it's less a masterpiece of Italian Renaissance painting than it is a document of a historical moment, as evidence of this moment of circulation and trade in the early modern period. And it's less Gentile Bellini that matters here than Mehmet II who matters. It's the patron who activated this, this trade that's really at issue. This really is in keeping with this more global narrative that we're seeing around art history in general. And excitingly for this painting, I think, it really got this painting recognized again, and it got it on the move. It started touring, and it traveled a lot. It has traveled to many places over the last few decades. And I'm gonna end by telling you about its return to Istanbul, which was part of this movement, and happened in 1999. This is the first time it went back to Istanbul since it was painted. Um, it was, <laughs> I love this picture, it was, uh, um, brought to the city to feature in uh, an exhibition that was organized by the Yapi Kredi Cultural Institution, the Yapi Kredi Bank's cultural arm, for the occasion of the 700th anniversary of the founding of the Ottoman dynasty. And it was a hugely successful show. Um, 30,000 people visited it in one month. And it garnered big headlines like this one, which translates as Fatih's famous portrait brought to Istanbul. Fatih means conqueror. So we've got Mehmet as the conqueror of Constantinople. But there's also Mehmet, the painting, reconquering Istanbul. Um, and you can see how it's being received here, like even like an ambassador, with a lot of fanfare and presentation. 
And people were really excited to have it there. There was an article in the New York Times about it where one visitor talked about how we all know this painting. We've seen it so many times. It's imprinted on our brains. You know, it's great to have it back. It's finally here. The layout of this very small exhibition tells us an interesting story too. It's a story of harmony, of balance, and coming together. You can see at the center of the exhibition the painting of Mehmet. It's the only actual work of art in the gallery. And on either side are text and image panels. On the left, the story of Gentile Bellini. On the right, the story of Mehmet II. So it's this coming together of these two great traditions to make this wonderful masterpiece. Uh, a message of collaboration, cooperation, harmony, and all those good things. Um, and this really made sense because 1999 was the year that Turkey was making its first appeal to join the European Union. So there was this moment of optimism and alignment of values, um, at least it was hoped. And, and the picture was a tool of diplomacy. The, British probably lent it to help leverage a good relationship with Turkey, and the Turkish organizers wanted to get Turkish culture out onto a, a global cultural stage. So a very kind of happy message. Um, but things have changed, like so many things have changed, and I, I want to conclude uh, with some thoughts on the painting's meaning today. Um, because it really is visible and known, the um, Nobel Laureate Orhan Pamuk says, the portrait has spawned so many copies, variations, and adaptations that there cannot be a literate Turk who has not seen it hundreds, if not thousands of times. So I went to Istanbul in 2018 to check this out myself, um, to look for it, to talk to people, to talk to wax figures at the museum, and I really found it to be true. I mean, the image is widely known and it proliferates. You can see it here on all sorts of historic objects, but also all sorts of merchandise, including a perfume that if you're willing to pay $275, you can get. Um, it's all over the internet in all sorts of memes. And it's also really all about all over town. And I, I want to point out that it's not just Mehmet II who is present, but it is really Gentile Bellini's rendering of Mehmet II, who has come to stand for him. And even if you go on Wikipedia, if you look up Mehmet II, you're going to see Gentile Bellini's portrait. So it has become the iconic emblem of this individual, even in Turkey. Now remember 1999, it was about coming together in peace and harmony. By contrast, what I found in 2018 was a, a, a turning of the portrait to a more separatist kind of mentality along the lines of, um, shall we say, make Turkey great again. So it's being harnessed to a sense of sort of identity politics, of separatist, nationalist pride. Um, and this is really in line with the use of Ottoman signifiers in the general culture. Uh, things Ottoman had really been discarded with the fall of the empire and the founding of the Tur Turkish Republic. The Ottoman uh, uh, alphabet was discarded. Uh, the, the capital was moved from Istanbul to Ankara. The Fez was um, banned. Um, but that has changed in recent years. And President Erdogan and his conservative followers have really embraced Ottoman symbolism. Uh, and this is interesting, I don't know if you followed in the news, but they had a, a major political defeat this yes. weekend in local elections. So, you know, the story is going to continue. Um, but so they've adopted Ottoman themes in fashion, in architecture, in film, in TV. Um, it enters the religious sector, so Hagia Sophia that had become a, a museum is now, again, a mosque. Conquest Day, which is the holiday celebrating the, the taking of the city, the conquering of the Byzantine city, is now a huge deal with a very military flavor to it with Air Force flyovers and things like that. And the take on the portrait runs along similar lines. So I surveyed and I interviewed about 150 people as part of this research. I talked to, I'll just quote a couple, uh, a 40-year-old man named Tassim, who described himself to me as a classic Muslim and a conservative. And looking at the portrait of Mehmet, he said, I love this guy. Mehmet is the center of everything. People on the left blame everything on Mehmet. Um, and I found 
some similar sentiment or complementary sentiment on the left. This is a page from Ozge Samanchi's memoir of growing up in Turkey in the 1980s, and she describes this very annoying poster that was on a, a bulletin board in her high school. And it says underneath, you are at the age when Fatih conquered Istanbul, remember, 21. So she found this, this suffocating, oppressive, judgmental message that really summarizes her feelings of growing up in, in Turkey. <coughs> So my point is that the painting that once was sort of seen as a unifier is now really polarizing. And I think the conversation really continues to evolve. Just a few weeks ago, uh, and shout out to my friend Rob Levine for sending me this, um, the portrait was the cover picture in a Financial Times review of this new book, How the World Made the West. The review has no mention of this painting, has no mention of painting at all. But, interestingly, it was written by the director of the Victorian Albert, so um, this is a painting in his purview at the moment. But my point here is that it really is an image that stands for global conversations, even out in the public sphere, in the non-specialist sphere. So I, I, I hope you'll take away a few points from my presentation today. One is about how this single artwork really multiplies in meaning as we look at it deeply and at its longer life. And the other is how um, thinking about the context of a multicultural object like this one, this sort of deep, long looking at it, is a valuable way of moving us away from, or at least complicating, the more essentialist notions of East versus West, and toward a more nuanced understanding of these cross-cultural interactions. And with that, I want to plug my book. And I don't have copies of it, but I do have order forms with a discount at the back of the room. If you are interested, please take one. And now I do want to turn this over to Eugenio, who's going to introduce Alex Dika Segerman. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for such a fascinating um, journey. I mean, I think you all have a sort of got a sense of the richness of this book and uh, um, how many uh, sort of layers, as I said earlier, we find in this, in this research. And uh, um, I have to say that I would love to be at one of those parties at the uh, lay yards in Venice. Um, but uh, apart from that, let me move on to the second part of our sort of uh, formal uh, um, event here before the Q&As. Um, so uh, Dr. Alex Dick Segerman is going to um, give us a response um, to um, Elizabeth's presentation. So Alex is an associate professor of Islamic art history at Rutgers University. Uh, prior to joining the Rutgers Newark faculty in 2018, she held uh, postdoctoral fellowships at Smith College, Hampshire College, and Yale University. In 2022, she was the Leonard Loder Visiting Senior Fellow at CASVA in Washington. Um, Dr. Segerman's scholarship investigates the intersection of Islam and modernism in art history. This includes archival research on modern Middle Eastern art movements, as well as an examination of how Islamic art history is a product of the modern era. Um, she has numerous publications. I will limit my sort of uh, list here to a couple of titles. Um, her two, uh, 2019 book with uh, University of North Carolina Press Modernism on the Nile, Art in Egypt between the Islamic and the Contemporary, and uh, recently a co-edited volume, Making Modernity in the Islamic Mediterranean with Indiana University Press. Um, she has published articles on modern Egyptian sculptor uh, Mahmoud Mukhtar um, and Egyptian surrealism. Um, at Radgers, uh, Dr. Segerman is also the co-chair of the Islam, the Humanities and the Human Working Group. So please join me in welcoming Alex for a response to Elizabeth's presentation. Hello, thank you, okay. Thank you, Eugenio, for that um, introduction, and thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me um, to give this response today. I'm sorry if my voice is a little um, scraggly. I'm just getting over a cold, but um, <clears throat> it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, and as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, we met last summer on a two-week photography history seminar in Florence, and when she told me about her book, I was just absolutely thrilled. 
Um, I teach this painting almost every year um, and have since uh, I started teaching Islamic art history in 2014. So while 15th century Ottoman art is not my area of specialty, I focus more on the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, when in art history programs, when you teach outside of Europe, you're often asked to teach everything. <laughs> so I teach classes that start at the Dome of the Rock and go until the present day. Um, and so I always include this painting. Um, I have probably graded hundreds of exams um, that talk about this painting. So I was really thrilled that somebody had done the great work of really tracing how this painting came to be and its course of travel from Istanbul to Venice to London. And so what I think sets uh, Elizabeth's book apart from most art histories is its unique methodology. So in instead of telling us an art history of an artist or a movement or a style of art, she gives us a deep and thorough history of one single artwork over the last five centuries. And in doing so, I think this study challenges the binary east-west divide of art history on a really granular level, as we see the many players that contributed to its meaning um, have come from all over the Mediterranean, not just Istanbul, not just Venice, not just London, right, all together. Um, and so as evidenced by her deep historical research, the artwork and its meanings are clearly a product of this long history of a Mediterranean network of exchange. So in this response, I'm going to briefly mention two ways in which this painting, which um, um, the, the painting and Elizabeth's study intersect with my, with my work and um, uh, show its larger significance in the field of art history. So first, in my teaching, uh, in my introductory Islamic art course, this portrait helps me talk to my students about portraiture, what is a portrait, how do we define it, how do we describe it, but also the geographic and artistic differences between the three early modern empires of the Islamic world. Um, so that is the o Ottomans in Turkey, and then as you, that was a great map. <laughs> so like first the Ottomans start out sort of in Istanbul and around in Anatolia and Greece, and then slowly sort of take over the whole Mediterranean. Um, <clears throat> Safavid Iran is the second of the three modern, early modern empires, and Mughal Northern India. So I often compare uh, the portrait of Mehmed to the Shatamas Shaname, which is an illustrated Persian epic that tells the stories of the historical and mythical kings of Iran. Shatname literally means the book of kings. And so Shatamas, who is the so Shatamas was the ruler that commissioned this artwork. Um, and it's a book that has hundreds of paintings in it, but also um, Persian poetic text. And there's never a painting of him in this book. So we have no portrait of Shah Tapmas anywhere in this book. But of course, as I explained to my students, it's a kind of portrait. It's an allegorical portrait. And so comparing these, a very traditional art historical methodology, really shows the differences between these two early modern empires. Um, and interestingly enough, for the story of, of, of the Ottomans, the Shah Tamas Shahname was gifted to the Ottoman Empire in 1568 and was in the collection of the Ottoman um, treasury for uh, many, many centuries until um, it was bought by the Rothschilds in around 1900. So when I taught at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, most of my students were art history majors. And the unusual quality of this painting um, that it was a in the Renaissance style, but depicting an Islamic um, or a Muslim ruler was very, very clear to them, and uh, especially since they had taken so many semesters of European art history. It was an easy jumping off point to discuss verisimilitude and the changes that would happen in Ottoman portraiture in the 16th century um, with the Shamail Name, which uh, Elizabeth talks about in her book, which is this very famous um, depiction of the Ottoman sultans and their physiognomies, but as you can see here, very much in that Persianate painting style um, that was coming out of Iran rather than in the Italian um, Renaissance style. So most of my students at Rutgers Newark, however, are not art history majors. And when they take my Islamic art class, it's usually the only Islamic art, it's usually the only art history class they will ever take. Um, and Rutgers, New York has one of the largest Muslim American student populations in the United States. So my Islamic art classes are usually filled with students who are, are Muslim or identify with Muslim heritage in some way. Um, and most of them are not familiar with the Italian Renaissance. 
um, and the artistic traditions of Western Europe. It's just not something that they studied in high school. They haven't taken classes on it in college. And so when I show them these two paintings, they don't see the difference. <laughs> uh, with the art history students at Smith, I'm automatically recognize this as Italian Renaissance and that as you know, Islamic hate painting. Um, but my students at Rutgers, they just they both they they're like this is the same. These are two paintings of the same man. Um, it's not a photograph, right? Um, and and it, it really challenges me to just to describe the different ways these paintings are painted, obviously, like from a formalist point of view, but also, you know, that maybe that's more accurate, right? Maybe when this, when Mehmed um, commissioned this painting, there wasn't that east-west divide in such a clear way, and um, uh, he had just he had just conquered the Byzantine capital, right? So he it sort of is a very logical result of a. Uh, of an era when um, this new empire was bringing Islam into a Christian city, into a Christian region, and this seems to just be sort of a like a logical result of that, rather than a hybrid image or um, um, an unusual one. So this could perhaps be another story in Dr. Rodini's precise and wide-ranging examination of the travels of the painting. Of course, the painting isn't physically coming to my classroom, but of course, it's digital images. And when that digital image does enter the classroom, it morphs once again, used as an excellent tool to ex explain the emergence of an early modern empire to 20-year-old 20, 20 American students, further proving its importance to the field of global art history. Okay. So another part of uh, the book that really stuck out to me was um, Elizabeth's vivid description of how the diplomat Sir Austin Henry Layard acquired the painting. She writes, quote, on a dank evening in 1865, an elegant British gentleman is climbing carefully into his sleek black gondola. He is startled by a figure stepping out of the shadows. With a tilt of his head, the figure gestures to an object clamped awkwardly under his right arm. It is a painting and its dark surface glistens with moisture. 12 pounds, sir, signore, solo dodici, for the painting, Bellini, gentili Bellini, unquote. It is, of course, a little shocking to think that this world-famous painting was once tucked under the arm of an old man in a Venetian canal, and the note about moisture probably would throw any conservator into a tizzy. <laughs> but on the other hand, this kind of history of an ob art of art of an art art object is probably more the norm than the exception, right? So we see these image, these artworks in the museum, in their glass cases, and you know, a lot of them have had these sorts of histories where they have been, you know, tucked under arms or um, layered on camels' backs, and you know, like they've they've had their own travels over many centuries. And so her method really exhibits how you know we should think more deeply about the paths that these art objects have taken. Um, so it further, to bring it a little bit to the research project that I'm working on right now, um, it helps me, the, her methods help me further understand and question a painting that I have been working on, also of a turbaned man. Um, the portrait of the formerly enslaved West African man, Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, painted in 1733 by an English portraitist named William Hoare of Bath. Ayuba was an upper class man from the city of Bundu, which is today in Senegal. He was captured and enslaved in an excursion gone wrong, but he ultimately was able to argue for his freedom and return to Africa due to his family connections. He ended up spending about a year or so in England before sailing back to Bundu, during which time this portrait was painted. While his published memoirs uh, were known and subsequently analyzed by 20th century scholars, the painting, like the painting of Sultan Mehmed, was lost for many centuries. Oops. <clears throat> In 2009, um, a modest family from Cornwall, England, decided to put the painting up for auction. Um, so people had known that this painting existed. There are engraving, engraved copies of the painting, but the actual painting had been lost for uh, um, since 1733 until 2009. It was not publicly known, um, and uh, th this was also this is also at a time when. 
narratives of enslaved Muslim Africans in the United States were gaining prominence and recognition in public discourse. Um, and so when it came up for sale, um, it has this S you can see here, it's like one of those like, whoa, <laughs> um, estimated price 50,000 pounds, a realized price um, uh, almost 10 times as much or more than 10 times as much. So even though the National Portrait Gallery in London raised um, a significant amount of money, it was ultimately purchased by the Qatar Museum Authority, which is in Qatar, Doha. Um, and due to export bans, so similar, again, similar story to this uh, Sultan Mehmed's painting, you know, issues about it leaving its country um, of creation and, but also, you know, coming into more prominence in the modern and contemporary era, like its meanings develop more in the modern contemporary era. So due to export bans and a diplomatic agreement, it is now hanging in the National Portrait Gallery in London, even though it is owned by Qatar. <clears throat> so there are many similarities between the two paintings beyond the turbans. Both paintings were known about for many centuries before they came to public view. Both are probably more important for the historical moment of cross-cultural contact that they represent than for their artistic merits. Both are often lauded for the empathetic, mimetic portrayal of the sitters, and both are also the only um, known portraits from life that we have of either man um, in existence. Much in the same way that Vasari commented on Mehmed's aversion to mimetic portrayal, Ayuba's biographer also commented on Ayuba's unease at having his portrait painted. And lastly, both canvases have been caught up in British geopolitics of the 21st century um, with Doha and Istanbul, respectively. This comparison reveals that the meaning of the painting is not just located within the paint strokes on the canvas, but wrapped up in a web of historical and transnational connections that give meaning to the artworks. Uh, Dr. Ronidi's book is not only a carefully and expertly um, does not only carefully and expertly trace the object uh, of this painting, but also enacts an art historical methodology that helps us better understand objects that exist between borders and ultimately help us question the arbitrariness of those borders in the first place. Thank you. King? Yes, it is. Um, great. Thank you, Alex, for the response to Elizabeth's presentation. Thank you again, Elizabeth, for uh, the presentation. It's been really a wild ride through the centuries with so many interesting uh, things to say. Um, I, you know, of course, I do have you know questions, but I thought we might begin maybe with um, either a response to the response or some sort of uh, um, issues or questions which you might have for one another, and then we can move forward, starting from. Hello? Yes, oh, yes, here it yes. goes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
um, if you allow me to ask the first question, <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that the methodology of this book, um, which is also similar to the methodology of your next book, where you focus on one block in Rome th through history. And so if you could tell us a little bit about how you decided on this method, were there other scholars who did the same sorts of things that inspired you? What are the pros and cons of this kind of methodology rather than that more traditional approach of telling the story of a group of artworks over time um, from a particular artist or movement. Um, why did you decide on this method um, and like what does it open up but what are its limit and what are its limitations? Well thank you um, for the question and thank you I and I just want to show Alex's Thanks. book too. Uh, you know, if you don't have enough to read, please add modernism on the Nile to your, Thank you. to your list. Um, well, in some ways you, 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 you answered that question really well. I mean, the, the two books that I've, the one that I've written and the one that I'm working on are similar in that they're really about very deep, intense looking at a single thing or a single place. And I think what I'm trying to do is eke out you know, all the meaning, as much of the meaning as I can out of these things and position them more fully in the world in that way. Um, and I think it's valuable because it, it helps, in, in the case of this portrait, for example, it helps us understand the ongoing value. It even helps make an ongoing value for these things that we tend to discard. You know, old master painting is so, like, not what we think is interesting. And the fact that your <laughs> students don't know these pictures really speaks to that. So I think it's a way of keeping these things alive and keeping them relevant. Um, in terms of sort of models, um, it, it's funny, I don't know of another book that's quite like this one, but I'm sort of hoping that your next uh, project will will be its, <laughs> its kindred spirit. That would be great. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about archaeology lately because of my, my current project. So I think archaeologists do this kind of work. They take one place and they really examine it. Yeah. At least those are do, who are doing sort of a stratigraphic analogy. Um, and I, I've, I'm, I, I guess a lot of what I've been inspired by is work of people who are interested in the migration of things, mm -hmm. which which ties in less to the archaeological project than to this one. Um, so sort of people interested in mobility and the the changing values of things across space, um, sort of in a post Arpaderai kind of moment. So someone like James Clifford, who's an anthropologist, but writes about, in his book, Roots, about the fact that it's helpful to think of objects as moving rather than sort of roots as being rooted in the ground, right? That, that we get a whole new perspective when we think that way. Um, and I, I think that by looking closely at one thing and then clustering things around it, we, um, we open up, we just, we simply open up new ways of thinking, new ways of making connections. It's like new neural pathways or something like that. Um, and I can give you a couple examples, I, I, things I didn't talk about. There's a really interesting case of a, another Italian painter, another Venetian from the late 19th century named Fausto Zonaro, who goes to Istanbul and becomes a court painter. And his wife is a photographer. And I never would have encountered this person if I hadn't found the copy of Gentile Bellini's portrait that he did. So a whole other world of connections gets made by this really close, close study. And I think that breaks down some of the things that are so familiar. We think we know things. We think we know we know what this is about. We think we know what it's telling us. But actually, it, by making new clusters of meaning, I think we really enrich mm -hmm. objects. So I think that's, that's the pro. You did ask about the cons of working that way. Did you? Yeah, I yeah think of you course. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing I realized when I you know, people will think, oh, you know all about Gentile Bellini, and I, I really don't know that much about his other work. You know, you become the sort of specialist in one thing, and other things fall to the side. Mm -hmm. So I think one way of focusing diminishes another way of focusing. Right. But, you know, you and I have talked about this. How do you become, global art history wants you to know everything, especially if you're an Islamicist, <laughs> you know. You, you can't get away with it. Um, so you have to replace one kind of expertise with another expertise, and that's just something we're always going to struggle with mm -hmm. just because of limited mm -hmm. bandwidth, I guess. Um, and I have some thoughts about what we can do about that, but maybe maybe we'll move on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, did you have a question, or can I... Can I you can go ahead, and then I'll... I want to ask Alex sure. a question. Um, 
I want to ask a question about your book. Oh, okay. And in a way, I'm putting the same question back at you, but um, Alex frames a really interesting methodology in her book, Modernism on the Nile, um, asking that we think instead of about the global, which you have some questions about as a term, to the constellational. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can tell us what you mean by that, and <laughs> is this a method that I could apply to my own research, or is it specific to what you're working on? Oh, thank you so much for reading the book. You didn't have to. Um, but yeah, so in my book, uh, I focused on a non-Western modernism. And often a lot of the terminology that's used to talk about modernism is very based in Euro-American narratives. And so I really wanted to move away from those words, um, like avant-garde um, and other... And other uh, words that privilege a Greenbergian teleology um, that that excludes a lot of artwork that is not made in Europe and America or artwork made by individuals who are not white men usually as well. So I wanted to come up with a framework for discussing that. Um, and so I I really, I tried to describe what I had seen in modern Egyptian art um, and what a word that really seem to accurately describe how they were making their art was constellational in that they are referencing their mo their connections to um, different art forms, different art histories, um, places they had been, where they had studied, say, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, but also ancient Egyptian sculpture, but also Egyptomania, um, jewelry design. They're referencing these very specific and finite um, places that they had been and things that they had seen, and they're referencing them in the artwork. So it's an aesthetic and a conceptual um, method. Um, can it be, I would love for it to be <laughs> applied outside of Egypt. I've talked to uh, uh, other global modernists who, who think that it might be applicable to, say, Mexico or India or China. Um, and, and I think it's really the finite connections that definitely distinguish it from contemporary art, mm -hmm. which has a multitudinous connections. Mm -hmm. So it will look more like, um, I don't know, firework than, um, than a constellation. So it's that fi those finite connections, but, um, I would be delighted for people to use it in other ways. So thank you for asking. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking that it would be, it's a good analogy for my work too, I think, in a certain way. But let's. let's. Well, thank you for all the sort of stimuli you're giving us, both of you. And uh, I, have, I, I have a few questions, but one which I would like to start with, which is really sort of stemming out of the reading of um, Elizabeth's book, but which I think would apply also to some of the points which Alex, you were just uh, making about your own research, um, has to do with the storytelling dimension of the research. Which, of course, you know, I mean, as a literary scholar, one of the things which I got really fascinated by re when reading the book was the idea of telling the story of this protagonist, which is an object, traveling through through time. And, of course, you know, uh, this implies storytelling not just as your tool, but also dealing with stories told by others, beginning with Vasari, and then, you know, we could sort of bring up the other examples you made, um, which, of course, you know, raises questions about, uh, you know, the sort of methodology which we use. Um, uh, I personally like the idea of telling the story of either texts or objects or whatever um, as kind of living things. Um, and... Uh, but of course, it's a tricky thing because it borders with other genres, which are quite often, you know, sort of uh, um, seen as other than what we do as scholars. Even the kind of sources which uh, you have been mentioning, you know, uh, newspapers uh, or even the reproductions of the painting, uh, which come into the narrative as elements of this jigsaw which you're putting together. And uh, so, if you have further thoughts, on this particular dimension, the storytelling dimension of, 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 of this way of doing research and telling the stories of objects, I would, I, I would love to hear about that. Well, I've been thinking a lot about that, especially for my new book, because I'm really experimenting with different ways of writing. But Alex read a perfect uh, excerpt about that, because that little 
narrative that somebody said it's like a beginning of a movie or something. And I, and I don't know that there was moisture on the painting. I mean, I made that up. But it's Venice, and it was, it was definitely a dark night in Venice, so there had to be some moisture. Um, but we know from a letter that Layard wrote to his friend, uh, Giovanni Morelli, who was an important <coughs> connoisseur. I found this painting, and this is how it occurred to me. So I took the letter, and I kind of added a little dramatic twist to make it more legible. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I feel that a lot of what we do as art historians is inviting us to push some of these boundaries because, um, you know, I can quote that letter to you, but it doesn't capture the kind of experience that the, the writer is having writing the letter. And it, it sort of depersonalizes the, the material. So I believe in deeply researched material, but um, material that allows for a certain leeway in interpretation. So that recognizes that you know, these are people interacting with these things, people making these things. It's hanging in, in, in at this party. And no, you know, no one's writing down exactly where what was hung where, but we get impressions of the past that come to us. And those impressions are, are valid. And I think, you know, you have to be skeptical of your sources. Vasari is a hugely, uh, he's, he's a minefield of things. But you can use his work selectively and find sort of points where it resonates with other stories. And, and sort of with that comparison and back and forth, I think you can arrive at a certain confidence. Um, and, and I believe we have to broaden our sources or we're sort of, we run out of steam at a certain point. And it's a good way to break down, again, those familiar tales that we tell ourselves again and again. And I think it's a false narrative to think that we as scholars haven't been telling stories. We are. We're just selecting our sources differently and giving words to them that are follow a different kind of pathway. Yeah, and the, I think your writing also shows the power of the story and um, a a legible, legible, sometimes art history can be a little <laughs> hard to read, <laughs> you know, um, jargony, uh, a thousand footnotes, referencing, you know, lots of different previous scholarship. It can kind of bog, when it's very, very, very rigorous, it can also like bog it down and it, you lose that, the story, the story um, that can actually help the reader understand the whatever it is that you're talking the art history better. Mm -hmm. So your writing is, you know, that, that vignette, like I'm never going to forget that. It was a very, it's so memorable, but also you can, like I talked about, like you can use that as, as a way to say, this has happened to so many of the artworks that we now look at and they don't exist in a vacuum <laughs> um, on a, on a museum wall that they have these complex histories. And now that provenance re research is also becoming so important, especially for artworks that, you know, are coming from other places, it, you know, um, colonial f artworks that have come out of colonial conquests that are now in um, European and American museums. You know, the stories, the provenance stories behind those artworks, um, you know, each each artwork is going to have a story like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to, you know, think about that kind of the poignancy of the story makes you think about the wider importance of that kind of history to the field. So that, that's a great point, yeah. Maybe I can add one thing and then maybe we can take a few questions. I, um, I was struck by something you said, Alex, and this, this I, I, you said at some point damage as inspiration. I can't remember exactly what you were talking, I wrote it down. And I wanted to address the damage to the painting because I mentioned it a few times, but it does get to this story issue as well. As I was working on this book, when I first started, this came out of about three pages of my dissertation that were very much positioned in the 15th century. Um, and I thought, I, I had discovered this story of the exhibition of 1999, and I had discovered this story of this search for similar portraits in the 16th century by the Ottoman Sultan Murad III. And I thought, hmm, you know, there's this larger life. But then I started to worry, but what if this isn't the painting? Because there's, right, this, there's this history, there's this doubt that I talked to you about that maybe it isn't. Now the, the sort of tides have turned and people generally think this is the painting that Gentile Bellini painted, but it's heavily damaged. What if it's not, and I've written this whole book and then the whole scaffold of my book <laughs> collapses? Well, I, I sort of realized, well, we know this is the painting that was recovered in 1865, 
And we know that there's this whole imagining of, a, of it of, in the period that leads up to that. So there's something there. And damage becomes the kind of way of thinking about this history because it's damaged because it's traveled a lot. So it sort of invites, to me it invited the story. Um, and it continues to provoke the story because you know someone's gonna say in a couple years that that's not, Gentile didn't paint that. And then I'll have to write another chapter to my book. <laughs> but it doesn't really change what I've said about it. As long as you keep in mind those doubts, I think the story can move forward. Thank you. Uh, I think we, you know, we have 10 minutes or so for questions and there will be a microphone yes, um, going around. Um, my thanks to both of you for a really fascinating presentation. We've learned so much. But I have two questions for Elizabeth. The first is, the Ottomans were very interested in Western military technology. Most of their um, admirals were Italians. What evidence is there of influence on their artistic um, traditions by the importation of Bellini? Was there any spin-off work among their artistic styles. <coughs> the second question is, goes to the, the line between storytelling and accuracy. And is, is there dangers in embroidering stories for purposes of making the narrative more alive, more vivid, um, appealing to more people, and Accuracy. So if people in 50 years quote you in saying, make conclusions about the painting because Elizabeth Rodini says it was wet <laughs> when, when Layard acquired and then therefore there must have been mold or damage or whatever. I mean, what is the line there? Yeah, um, two really good questions. So Alex and I were talking about the first question before and I do have some Im images to show you, but there is some evidence in some image making that there was a legacy. Uh, there are some portraits of, of Mehmet that seem to have, there's one in particular um, that seems to have a European head. I mean, it, it's Mehmet's head, but he's represented with a sort of dimensionality that suggests this interest in a very there's similar modeling. representation. There's modeling, modeling and shadowing face. and shading. Right, and so like in the Shemail Neme, there's no modeling. It's very right. flat. Absolutely yeah. flat. Yeah. But the body is pretty flat, and yeah. he's got the sort of classic, he's sort of kneeling, and he's holding a, a handkerchief, and he's sm smelling a rose, which are these tropes in Ottoman portraiture. So there are, there are some images that evidence a kind of lingering interest in the portrait, or uh, sort of a residue of the portrait, I would say. No, N no, not that I know of, not that I know of, no. And then there's a really long history after Mehmed of Ottoman book painting. Um, I'm not an expert, but Emi Naif Advachi, who's at Boston College, is the expert. She's written some really great books about, one's called Picturing the Ottoman Court, and there was a lot of really long and boring um, <laughs> representations of court activities, celebrations, weddings, processions, um, over many, many, many centuries. Um, and so they turn of turned away from there, you know, there was this experimentation, at least how I t tell my students, there's experimentation with oil painting at this very early stage, but then it turned towards book illustrations. Um, court history, illustrated court histories became the norm for a few hundred years. And then once you get into the 18th, 19th century, it starts turning back towards, um, um, turning the view more towards Paris. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in the 16th century, as I mentioned, there is a particular book that Emine Fevacci writes about extensively that you showed an image from um, that in which the Ottomans decided we need accurate portraits and that's where, where they go to Venice. So there is this kind of lingering memory of, of the visit, I, I believe. Um, to your second question, yeah, I think, I think one has to be careful. I mean, if you look at my book, I footnote that comment and I quote the letter that it's based on. Um, and I may even offset it in italics or use some sort of tool to indicate that it's, you know, something of an, an invention. Um, 
but I would say then the person has to read the book and look at the source. I mean, that's always the case. And if you look at the source, you'll see it's footnoted and you'll see what it's based on. So I don't believe, at least certainly in this book, I don't believe in invention. Uh, but I think um, we can pull the story and give it color based on things that we know. Thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. I have two questions, uh, much briefer. Um, one is, uh, why do you think that the painting was in Venice for those 400 years? And the second one, I don't know if you were able to answer, but uh, uh, you may know that uh, Titian uh, portrayed the, the portrait of uh, uh, Suleiman the, the Magnificent and uh, his wife Roxelana. But as far as I know, he never went to uh, Turkey. So what do you know about that story, if you know something about that? Um, I really don't know much about the second question. I'll just be honest. I, I can't say much. Maybe Alex can. <laughs> Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Um, as to, <laughs> there we go, another book. Um, as to the first, um, yeah, in the book I follow three threads, three sort of theories of where it went. One, it was um, that it was in a famous collection of portraits uh, at Lake Como, which I think is just false because all of the evidence related to that doesn't seem to have anything to do with this portrait. Um, and the reason I think it was in Venice it seems the most likely thing, but because um, there's a remark in a treatise of the early 17th century by Pietro Bellori that it's in a collection of a Venetian noble, the Zeno family. So this is, this is I think it's around 1610 maybe. It's the only mention we have. Uh, there's no other proof, but it seems, you know, it's as, as close to a smoking gun as we have at this point. And the Zeno family had a really interesting history in, in the Ottoman territories. So they were a family that had had ambassadors and diplomats and had fought wars. And I can kind of imagine it there as a sort of, here, here we get to some invention, you know, is it sort of a trophy for the Zeno family? But it's because of this comment in the 17th century and it's really the only, the most solid evidence that we have. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a question, actually. I was born and raised in Turkey, so I just wanted to add my, my perspective. Um, I would say it's not just right-wing people in Turkey who, who like Mehmet the Conqueror, and anybody who likes art history, and art history in Turkey uh, likes him because he was, in my mind, a Renaissance man. He was, he was fluent in Greek, in Latin, in many other languages. He was really progressive, and at that time, for 15th century, it was really a revolution to uh, invite an artist, a painter from, from Europe uh, over to, to have your portrait done, because as you know, paintings are not allowed in Islam. Islam is an iconoclastic uh, religion, as many of you may know. So from that perspective, I think he was quite uh, progressive. And um, you know, even when, after he invaded Constantinople, he didn't change the, the name of the city. It, it continued being called Constantinia until the 20th century. And he didn't change the uh, uh, name of the big, big uh, church of Hagia Sophia. Although it was converted to a mosque, uh, it, it stayed as, we, we call it Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia means um, the holy wisdom in, in, in Greek. So, I mean, uh, I don't know. When I think about him, he was 21. He, he made the Roman Empire fall. If I was him, I would be so so full of myself <laughs> with that that kind of an accomplishment. I would have changed the name the name of the city, the the, the church, the mosque, and uh, everything. So, but yeah, so I, I I'm really grateful to to him that um, he created the, the town I was born and raised in. Obviously, along with uh, Emperor Constantine and Emperor Justinian, whom <coughs> I also adore. So thank you. Oh, thank you for those comments. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I would have loved to have known him. You know, you get that, who would you like to have dinner with? I don't know. <laughs> I would really like to know more about him. He was a fascinating individual. And it's one of my regrets that there aren't really more documents. I mean, to get to the point that was raised earlier, there isn't a whole lot of documentation that tells us really what he was thinking. You really have to pull together, you know, just morsels, tiny pieces to get a sense of him. But he was clearly 
a fascinating and, and brilliant person. So, uh, absolutely. Professor Khalid Inal, there is a good book on him. I would recommend. Okay, thank you. I think we had, Ellen, one more question. Great. Thank you both. This was really fascinating. I have a quick uh, sort of follow-up on that um, about Mehmet. Uh, when I was in college, I took a Byzantine history course, and the last day the professor narrated the events of May 29th, 1453, the last use of Hagia Sophia as a church, the entry of Mehmed into Constantinople. And I wonder what is there a visual record of all of this? Do, what kind of sources do we have mm. for that day? Is it, you know, in either contemporary written <coughs> sources or in later art historical sources? I actually don't know. I know that there are, um, I know of more modern representations of the entry, but I don't know of anything contemporary. Do you know any? Contemporary sources and that is way outside your field. No, but. I don't. I, nothing comes to mind. I mean, you, you know, in the same way that. I'm sorry, what was your name? Yeah, Oslem. The same way that Oslem, you know, was uh, discussing how uh, the conversion of the church Hagia Sophia into a mosque. You know, the sort of the fact that it's still standing. Right. Yeah, he was twenty-one. He just conquered this, you know, important city. Uh, and he didn't destroy the church. You know, they converted the church. And actually, the the um, mosaics. There's a lot of Christian mosaics all over the church. And for a long time, they just left them there. And then they were white, like sort of plastered over. Um, anyway, there's like lots of people have done lots of great research on on that on those mosaics. But I I would like in my class, I would use the church and the church's conversion into a mosque as sort of a representation of that day. Sort of like we don't have a an actual mimetic representation of um, him coming into, into town, but the fact that the church is still standing and was converted into a mosque is a testament, maybe a testament to that. I always tell my students, he entered he entered on Tuesday, the city on Tuesday, and on Friday they were having services in the in Hagia Sophia as a mosque, and like that—that's the representation that I would that I would use. Yeah. But you should go see the Conquest Museum, and then you'll get a <laughs> three sixty diorama of the in oh, okay. Conquest. <laughs> right. Well, okay. I think you're perfectly on time. This was really fascinating. I think we really had this very beautiful conversation and thinking of all these questions just you know as a final thought I was really thinking that uh, um, maybe it's kind of even obvious to say but uh, the portrait does this kind of work where um, it really works as a window sort of uh, looking both ways and of course I really like very much your point about the archway uh, which is very symbolic which was which is also very antiquarian where very humanist uh, very um, uh, Venetian in terms of uh, the uh, figurative culture which it's conveyed through it, but at the same time is the sort of uh, framing of this figure who is really kind of uh, uh, looking uh, both both ways, which is also what in a way the the city of uh, Istanbul, Constantinople have been has been doing for for centuries, right? Uh, and of course, this kind of discourse and narrative can then be used for different purposes. Um, and the most recent examples were a great way of sort of showing how this very image can be resignified uh, in order to serve um, different scopes. So uh, it was really. Um, uh, a great um, sort of overview of this fascinating story. So I would like to thank once again Elizabeth Rodini and Alex Egerman for being with us tonight. Uh, and I would like to thank you all for uh, being with us in a, you know, in an evening which was not particularly sort of uh, pleasant outside in terms of weather. And so thank you for making it through uh, the rain um, and, 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 and be with us. Until the next time. Thank you. Thank you.